We're going to talk today about keys to the kingdom of God. And specifically, we're going to start with Matthew chapter 16, where Christ Yeshua asked this question, Who do men say that I am? And the answer to this question leads to him saying, I've got keys for you to my kingdom. I want to tell you right now, God has a revelation for everybody here. And it's about the rock of your salvation. And so I want to start by talking about the rock of salvation. And say to you that my Lord, the living Christ, Yeshua, He is the rock of my salvation, it says in Psalm 62. He is the stone the builders rejected in Acts 4. He is the rock that spews forth living waters in 1 Corinthians 10. He is the rock that crushes all nations in Daniel chapter 2. He is the precious cornerstone in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 6. He is the rock of all truth in John 14, 6. He is the mountain that fills the whole earth in, John, in uh, Daniel chapter 2. He's the mountain all other nations will flow to in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2. He is the rock that becomes my fortress and my deliverer in Psalms 18, 2. And he is the rock of all ages in Psalms 95, 1. Hallelujah. And if you receive him, He'll rock your world and he'll crush the enemy because he is the rock of ages. Today we talk about the rock. God has a very special revelation for each of us today. Amen. I just thought I would start with that declaration about the rock. He gives us keys to the kingdom and I want to look at them in uh, Matthew chapter 16. If we pick it up uh, at verse 13, it says, When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I am? And, uh, and so they said, Some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Others say Jeremiah, one of the prophets. They said, no, 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 forget about what they're thinking and what they're saying. Who do you? He's asking his closest disciples, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter spoke up, and he said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus, Yeshua, answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father, who's in heaven. And now verse 18 is very important that we understand the meaning of the rock. I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now there are some traditions and some religions who teach that he built his church on Peter. And there's a succession of popes that follow him, all based on this scripture. Here's the problem with that, folks, and it's printed for you in my notes. There's a play on words. The word for Peter here is Petros, and if you want to write this down and look it up in your Strong's Concordance, you can. Uh, it would be number 4074. But the word here for Peter is you're a tiny pebble. And then he says, but upon this rock, and in this instance he uses a different word, it's Petra. And the word means massive rock. Amen. On this side, he, what he was saying is, look, Peter, you're just a pebble. But on the confession you made about me, on this massive rock, I'll build my church. It wasn't being built on Peter. It was being built on the confession about Christ being the massive rock. Does that make sense? Amen. Amen. On that confession. And then I want you to go on to verse 19. After the confession, he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loose on earth. So he's giving them the keys to the kingdom, and the way that the keys to the kingdom operate has to do with something with binding and loosing. 
Now we gotta pause on this because this is of tremendous importance. If I give Homer a Cadillac and tell him after church you can drive it home, here's a brochure on the Cadillac. It goes this amount of you know miles per hour. You know, it's got a new glide transmission. It does all these things. It's an, a marvel. It's an amazing car. All the comfort of a Cadillac. You can know all about that baby. But if you don't know, have the keys and know how to get into it, you're not going anywhere in that Cadillac. You know what? The same thing is true about the kingdom of God. We can know about all of the dynamics of the kingdom. And we're good at doing this. You know, if you go to theological school, I've, I've been to a number of theology schools. You spend a lot of time dissecting things and, and taking theology apart and studying the history of theology. But if you don't know how to use it, what good are you? Somebody said, you know, there's some guys that graduate in these schools and they're so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. We need to know how to use the keys of the kingdom, is my point. Amen. And the keys of the kingdom operate on the basis of binding and loosing. Well, what do those words mean and how do you use them? So I'm going to go into the Hebrew because when Christ was here using these terms, he was not using Greek or English, he was using Hebrew. And, and so what's happened is in the translation, we've missed the real meaning of these words. So... Even if you don't know the Hebrew letters, it's okay. But I've included them because some of y'all do. And so the word for binding is asar. And it is, you read from, you know, from right to left. So you have the aleph, smik, and the resh. What does that mean? The father supports the highest person is what it means. But the meaning of it in general is to forbid. So the terminology to bind is it's not a good translation. It, it has to, everything has to do with covenant in terms of God's kingdom. And so what he's really saying here, I'm giving you authority to forbid anything that hinders covenant in the lives of my people. Wow. You're dealing with fear. And the enemy is biting you in fear. And God says, I've given you authority to help people who are bound in fear. And so you get to speak to that fear and say, fear, I forbid you to operate in Homer's life. Amen. I've got the keys to do to speak that. And I release perfect love in his life. They cast out fear. And he'll be free from that fear. Because God loves him. And I'm declaring to him that God loves him. And so fear can't remain. When you understand it, it's beautiful. Now some people think that binding and loosing is just primarily to do with the devil. But it's much bigger than that. You can, you can do the binding and loosing thing with the devil, but really it's for the person. And so I'll, I'll give you some examples of that. Now the word loose here is amazing. Amazing. It means to allow. And again, it has to do with covenant. But look, I want you to look at these Hebrew letters, and I'm going to tell you what they mean. To declare the covenant work of the highest person. To loose somebody is to declare the covenant work on the cross of what the highest person did, which is the greatest demonstration of the love of God on earth. Today, people in various churches are interested in signs and wonders and miracles. You don't get them by focusing on, I wish I had a miracle. You're going to see signs and wonders and miracles when you learn how to do this. You learn how to loose somebody so that they understand the love of God for them to set them free in covenant love. <coughs> and in his plan, you'll get a miracle. Recently, I was in a medical office. Maybe somebody could bring me some water. I won't choke up here. <coughs> 
Recently I was in a medical office and I was talking to somebody about God's desire for us to walk in love. And how that when we live with pain of the past, we're living as victims of the past, and God has not called us to live as victims of the past, but to live in the freedom of His love. And this lady told me, she said, you know, I was raised in a home where I could never do anything right. Little sister came along, she got all the attention. I could bring home A's on my report card. In fact, she said I was a straight A student. It was never good enough. I felt criticized to the point where I just decided I had to, to try harder and try to earn and deserve my mother's love and recognition. And she said, I never got it. But what happens is, early, when you do this kind of stuff early in life, it becomes a part of your coping as an adult. She believed a lie. She wasn't good enough of love to be loved and affirmed and, uh, and cherished. She needed to earn and strive for that acceptance. She made a vow, and the vows we make keep those cycles in place. And so now as an adult, she's walking on eggshells in everything she does, thinking, what will people think of me? Maybe it's not good enough. I'll have to try harder, or people won't accept me. Where'd she learn that? She learned that from her mother. Okay? So that's a type of stronghold or bondage in the mind. That's where strongholds are. They're in the mind. So what does she need? She needs to know about, first of all, fear needs to be forbidden. And love needs to be released so that she can understand that God can free her from this past and he loves her and she can go free in that love. Where's the greatest demonstration of love in the universe? It's at the cross. I walked her in prayer with her mother to the cross. And I had her release her mother and give up her right to judge her, because you have to do that. She renounced the lie that she believed, that she wasn't good enough, and the vow that she would just perform well enough until her mom would recognize her and accept her. And because of that vow, the cycle of her childhood followed her everywhere. Oh, no wonder David prayed, Put truth in my inward parts, O oh Lord. Because I will know the truth, and the truth will set me free. She needed an encounter at the cross to get free. So I, when I walked her through that, and we released her mother at the cross, we asked God to break the lie and to break the vow that she made, and that the Father would give her the love that she's been seeking all her life from her parents but didn't get. You know how many people I'm describing right now on planet Earth? Look, we have to make the message of the gospel practical. It isn't about you've got a list of doctrines you believe and those doctrines are going to entitle you to be a great person. That's the Greek mindset. The Hebrew mindset is tasted and see the Lord that he is good. And he loves you. That's the Hebrew mindset. And so I prayed with her, and uh, I recognized at some point I got to use my authority because God gave me the keys. I'm speaking to fear. Now fear, you leave her. She has been set free by God's love. And she's a daughter of the king. Now fear, you get out and you exit. I'm allowing her to enter into the love of God and my Bible says perfect love cast out fear for fear hath torment, 1 John 4, 18. And there's not room for both. And when I did that, she said, she said to me, I felt something exit my head and leave. She got delivered by love. 
I never once cursed the demon. I never once asked him his name or talked to, to him. I introduced her to the love of God at the cross, had her surrender what she needed to surrender, and invited the love of God to come in. And perfect love casted out the fear. Fear of failure, fear of rejection, fear of abandonment, fear of being unwanted and unloved. The devil's kingdom primarily operates in fear. God's kingdom operates in love. We just need to have people switch kingdoms. Is this making sense to anybody? The gospel, the word gospel means good news. Come on, y'all. This is good news about what God wants to do in people's lives. And we can use the keys to forbid the enemy to work and to forbid sickness to forbid affliction, and then to loose the love of God and allow people to walk in covenant. Amen. When you're walking in covenant with Him, He takes you out of where you have been. Now the Bible says in Psalms 91, He will rescue your feet from the snare of the fowler. And then it, it says in another passage in, in uh, Psalms 41, I will set your feet on a solid rock and put a new song in your heart. You know what's so interesting about this encounter? I'm in a medical office. People are occasionally coming and going. We had a 10-minute break where nobody came in the room because God protected the time. And at 10 minutes, she got set free from a lifetime of bondage. And not only that, God gave me a word about her spiritual gifting. So we just, we released her spiritual gifting. Wow. You know, ministry doesn't just happen at church. It can happen anywhere we're at when we see people who are troubled or in need. And so one of the things we do on Sunday nights when we have um, our healing room is we teach people how to pray and how to minister healing. Now, I've been, I'm still learning. I'm still a student, but I've been doing this kind of stuff for 30 years. You know why? I was a foster child. I was abandoned. I was rejected. I was shamed. I was abused. And God had to take me through a healing process. And, and going through that, I learned some things about helping other people get free. Didn't read it in the book. I found it at the cross. Come on. And so I promise you, if you come here on Sunday nights, you're going to learn how to minister freedom to other people. And it won't come out of a box. Amen? We need to learn how to use the keys to the kingdom. One of the tremendous keys to the kingdom is the power of blessing. This is not on the script. Do you know that blessings are greater than curses? That's good news. It, sa it says in Exodus chapter 20 verse 5, the iniquity of the father goes to the third and fourth generation, but the blessings go to 1,000 generations. So much more powerful to learn how to bless somebody into freedom. When I was ministering in my office, because I've taught Margie how to give a mother's blessing, and, and I said to the lady I was praying with, I said, I wish my wife was here because if she was here, she'd bless you. And she'd give you everything your mother didn't. Because we can stand in the gap where people have failed or they have cursed. We can come and stand in the gap and reverse that by blessing. I've given hundreds of fathers blessings to people. And Margie's given many, many blessings, mother's blessings. We were in uh, Oklahoma at a training center for Native Americans. They come from various reservations and tribes. They come to a training center to learn spiritual warfare, how to go back to their reservation and help their people get free. I had no clue of the pain that some of these people walk through. 90% unemployed on some reservations. 
20 times higher suicide rate. Alcoholism, hopelessness, it's terrible. And so they actually asked me to come and teach about standing with Israel and the importance of what it means to be in covenant. But you know me, I, I couldn't help but talk about the love of God. So I opened up uh, the session by saying, hey, you know, we're going to talk about praying for Israel and, and, uh, and the Hebrew, what it means to be in covenant. But, you know, I just got to tell you before we do that, there's a word you need to know. It's ha-hava. And ha-hava means love in Hebrew. And it means the Father's heart is declared here or lifted up here. See, love in the Greek is about your needs and your wants and having everything me, me, meant. In Hebrew, the word for love is just come into covenant with the Father and be one with Him. And as you're lifted up and oneness in His heart, everything else in your life will align with His heart, align with Him, and you'll come free. And people started crying all over the room. And I went, God, I'm not quite ready for ministry yet. I mean, I just started. You know? <laughs> but there was such a wound there, a father wound. Abuse from their fathers, abandonment from their fathers. That I touched the pain of an entire nation of people. And so at the end of that, we have people walk their dads to the cross when we're going to give the Father's blessing and forgive them and release them. And then I speak a blessing. And then people were saying, well, wait a minute, my mother, you know, she wasn't good to me and wasn't there either. And so Margie then would have the mother's blessing over here. And we spent like an hour just praying with people who were coming up to leave stuff at the cross and get free from the wounds and, and get restored in the Father's love. There's such a... I've prayed for men in their 90s and had them weep and giving them the Father's blessing that they were robbed from. You're never too old to get a Father's blessing. One fellow told me that every year when I would come back, they knew what I was going to do, so... They, you know, they would talk among each other. Now, if you have, if you have Pastor Jerry pray for you, this is what's going to happen. And usually the power of God would fall. I mean, people would just be on the floor weeping. And so this great big burly guy comes up to me. He says, I just want to warn you in advance, Pastor. There's a man here who's filled with hate. I just want to warn you. So he's like the first one up at the altar call. He says, I'm the guy filled with hate. I said, really? I hate my dad. He left me and my mother. He beat me. I've only seen him one time since then. And he, wanted, and he told me he would like to kill me. And he said, I pray that I can find the man because I want to kill him. I said, well, hmm, we need a walk to the cross. <laughs> and so I walked him to the cross and told him, look, so look, here's the deal. You can live as a victim of what happened to you or you can come free in God's love and not have to be a victim as a son anymore. And I'll bless you into that freedom. And then you could just forget about him because he's not, what he is doing or did do or didn't do isn't going to define who you are anymore. You get to be free. I'm talking to somebody in TV land. So I prayed with him. And he released his daddy at the cross and gave up his right to judge him. That was the hard, hardest thing for him to do because he felt very justified in the hatred he was carrying. You didn't deserve God's forgiveness and love. Neither did he. He probably was passing on what he got from his dad. It's probably a generational curse. He was a victim too. Why don't we just bring the whole victimization and nail it to a cross? And so I led him to do that. He wept like a baby. He went over and knelt at the stage and just wept for the whole hour. 
it was just it was just leaving. One man I prayed for, he melted to the ground and began to scream. There was so much pain in his heart that when it serviced, it was overwhelming. I just would over put my hand on his chest and said, anger, fear, and pain, leave this man and come out of him. Stop that. Come out. And all of that stuff that was surfacing in here came out. I have never seen such pain with people as I have seen with First Nations. Do you know, and I'm not here to talk about them, they're the largest unreached people group in America. 90% of Native Americans do not have the gospel. And you know why? Maybe we can make this a matter of prayer. The church did that. At some point, we turned the administration over of reservations to the church. And so the Baptists and the Presbyterians and different ones, they set up these schools, boarding schools. And they told the children, you can't be native and Christian. You must give up being native. You can't keep your native name, your native dress, your native language. It's evil. You've got to stop that. Well, and then some, in some cases they were abused. So then, you know, when they grew up, they went back to their people, to their tribe, and said, forget about Christianity. You can't be who you are as a native and be a Christian. We don't need that. And so today, it's still the problem. When you talk to First Nations people, and you want to talk to them about Jesus, they will say to you, well, you can't be native and be a Christian too. And so we've decided we're going to be native. The church built walls to, against the whole people group. It's time that we pray for them and some of us go out there and talk to them about the love of God that receives a person where they are, who they are, for crying out loud. Look, God became a man with the Hebrew language and Hebrew dress in order to relate to a people group on the earth. Can we not do that with First Nations? My goodness, give me some moccasins. I'll go talk with them. Amen. We do this, and by the way, in other nations, we teach, you know, um, about going into a culture and honoring the culture. First Nations are a people of honor. And so one of the things that the church has to do is to figure out how to honor them and who they are and then bring what the church has. But this is all the power of blessing. To bless people into life. To forbid the work of the enemy. And to loose the work of the cross. And, the, and to loose the love of God in the people's lives. To declare the covenant work of the highest person is what it means to loose. And you get that from the Hebrew. We're hoping, by the way, that we're, we're going to film now as we go through each letter of the Hebrew alphabet and what they mean. And then we're going to have it posted on our website. So beginning next week, we're going to start filming the 22 letters of the alphabet and posting them so that people can learn how to unlock some of the truths that are in the Bible because they were given with that language. That's the Bible language. Old and New Testament. And you don't have to master, an, you know, another language. I struggle with English. But I learned some tools that can help me. You know, I've got this little sheet that gives me the letters of the alphabet and the word pictures. There's a word picture that goes with every letter and how they work. And now I can, I stick that in my Bible. I can go, okay, what does that mean? Yeah. Shalom. Peace is what is translated in. Christ sent his disciples out in Luke chapter 10 and said, I want you to speak peace over all the homes in every village, not some. Every village I will go in. You must go speak peace over all those homes and then heal them. Only he wasn't saying peace. In Hebrew, the word is shalom. It means something far different than peace and it, we, we lose it in translation. And so here's what it means. Shalom, the S-H, fire that consumes, the L-Lamed, 
authority, the mem, chaos. Put those three word pictures together and here's what you have. Fire that consumes whatever has authority over your chaos. And when you consume what has authority over it, you get free from it. Does sickness cause chaos inside a person's body? That's why he said to them, go speak shalom, release my fire, because I am an all-consuming fire. Release my fire over those families and take out what is causing and troubling them, what's, what has authority, and then you may go pray for them and watch them get healed and restored. So shalom is not a green, it's a weapon. And it's part of using the keys of the kingdom. But it got lost in translation. On our day here, when I say Shabbat Shalom to somebody, Shabbat means fire that consumes in the house of the covenant or the house of the cross. Shabbat Shalom, Dennis. Nothing's missing, nothing's broken on God's covenant day in your life. I made a declaration to you. That's what Shabbat's about, is people coming into covenant, getting wholeness, getting set free in God's love and to be blessed. It's not about the law. It's about a relationship. Do you understand the Sabbath was given 2,500 years before the law was given and before there was any Jew on earth? To all mankind as a covenant? so that we could have intimacy with him and nothing would be missing and nothing would be broken. And then the Ten Commandments came along and just said, remember the Sabbath. Why? Because it always was here. And so when people tell you, yeah, I'm going to visit that church, you know, they worship on Saturday. Oh, well, that's the law. Don't believe that. It's about a relationship. And it's about intimacy and wholeness in him. The apostles, Christ didn't change the Sabbath. The apostles didn't change the Sabbath. It was changed in 336 A.D. by a corrupt church in order to please a Roman emperor by the name of Constantine Amen. at the edict of Laodicea. That's why it says in Romans 4, there therefore remaineth the Sabbath rest for the people of God. And it says in Isaiah 66, and the new heaven and the new earth, we will come together from Sabbath to Sabbath. Amen. So if God was going to change the day, why are we going to have it in the new earth? See, the enemy wants to steal all the weapons of the church. He wants to take everything that will cause us to be able to use the keys of the kingdom to bring restoration and healing and wholeness to people so that his kingdom can be as free as possible to destroy on earth. Well, I'm here to tell you that in this house, we're not giving him any slack or any freedom to destroy. Amen? Well, I'm glad to share with you today about the keys to the kingdom. You still don't, Homer, you still don't get to have the Cadillac. That's all right. But, <laughs> but God has some awesome keys for us to operate in his kingdom that will take us places. And you watch, God will start giving some of you divine appointments to use the tools that we talked about today because the Holy Spirit will bring back to you when you're talking to somebody about walking them to the cross with whatever it is they got going on. That's the place. Let me just say this so that we don't forget it and we really get it. The cross is the place where the greatest demonstration of God's love and power was given. Amen. And when you bring a person there, and you release God's love to them there. You'll see signs and wonders. You'll see miracles. You believe it? That girl I prayed with and something went out of her head and left her that had been oppressing her most of her life. That was a miracle. But it was the love of God that produced it. Here's another thing you could do, uh, Billy Don. Put God on a limb. He likes it. I'm going to pray with you. 
And God's going to answer this prayer because the Father loves you. And so we're just going to bring this to the cross and trust him. And God's going to answer your prayer because he loves you. Now, can I give you a scripture to back that up? All right. Let's, let's take a moment because it's so important. Romans chapter 8. Watch this now. We're going out on a limb with the rock. <laughs> Romans. Come on, Romans chapter 8, verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Amen. Glory to God. He loves you so much, he delivered up his own son to demonstrate his love for you. How will he withhold anything from you? How will he not give you all things? I didn't say some things. How should he not give you all things that you need? Because his love is so powerful and so great. It's greater than any problem. It's greater than any lack. It's greater than any hindrance or broken heart. It's greater than anything on planet earth. And God says, I'll give you all things. Come and believe in my love. And walk out on the swim with me. And trust in my love and see if I won't show up and give you all things. Amen. Does all things include healing sickness? Oh, yes. All things. Whew. That's the power of his love. And wrapped up in it are the greatest miracles still waiting to be seen on earth. Not because you thought you could do a miracle but because you understand the miracle already exists in his love and you introduce somebody to it and bring them to him and it gets released in them and the miracle falls. Amen. There's some miracles waiting this week, I'm telling you. Wow. The disciples understood this in the book of Acts, which is why you see lots of miracles. You know, the love was so powerful in their life that Peter could walk along and his shadow would touch somebody and the shadow would cast out the devils and heal the sick and the shadow don't even know how to talk. Right. Come on. That's it. But it wasn't the man who was doing this. It was the God in the man that was doing this. It was the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And Romans 5, 5, I'm going to start preaching any minute. Romans 5, 5 says, Hope does not disappoint, for the Holy Ghost will shed a God abroad the love of God in your heart. Amen. That man was so filled with the love of God, even his shadow was carrying it. I'm not there yet, guys. But I'm praying any time that I'll start overflowing with the love. That's it. You know, Paul was carrying such anointing of the Father's love, they took, it says his apron, They, you know, maybe it was his prayer shawl, I don't know, but they were cutting up parts of his cloth and sending it to people where he couldn't go, and the cloth was casting out demons and healing folks. That's, That's mind-boggling to me. A piece of material can carry the love of the Father. There's no excuse for us not to have an impact in this earth if we're carrying the love of God. I, you hear me? I'm not saying doctrine. We're carrying the love of God. We will see things happen. You, you hear what I'm saying? We're not talking about carrying a church name. Or a tradition. We're talking about carrying the essence of who God is and what He longs to give. Yes. And when we get that, we'll be operating with the keys in the kingdom. Is this helping anybody? Father, we come to a close today asking for the keys to the kingdom, asking that you'll pour out your love in our hearts and, Father, use us as a force, oh God, knowing how to bind and loose, knowing how to forbid and to allow and to release the covenant work of the highest person, which is love, so that people get to go free and know who they are in him and be free to walk in that and to that love. Father, bless us here today to receive all that you have and then use us to loose others into it. 
all things. How shall he not give us all things when he gave his only son to show us how much he loves us? Father, we believe your love today. Have your way in our lives and use us to bless somebody else. We praise you and thank you in Yeshua's wonderful name. Amen. Hallelujah.